who maintained and nurtured a relationship with our Lord. I became acutely aware of this uh, one day when Riley's parents came to me and were sharing with me Riley's concern about his special gift. Um, apparently, I had been talking to the children about their gifts. I, a lesson I often give when they turn about six years old, they begin to compare themselves to each other. So I teach them that each of us have a special gift and that this gift needs to be nurtured. And so it's important that we pray about what is it that the Lord has given to me? What is my special gift? To help them to nurture their own gift, but also to become aware of the gifts of others and to praise others for their gifts and not to become jealous or envious of where they can see the differences. And so Riley, I guess, had talked to his parents about it and had said, you know, what is my special gift? The sister keeps talking about a gift I have, and I want to know what my gift is. And so his father tried to appease Riley and said, well, you know, you're an awfully good runner, Riley. And I said, no, that's not it. He said, well, soccer, you know, I see you do a great job at a soccer field. And Riley said, no. He said, how about your math? You know, I've seen you do great work with your math work. And again, Riley said, no. Um, his father's desire to flatter Riley did not appease his, his own knowledge of himself and what the Lord wanted him to do. So finally, his father said, well, why don't you go pray about it, Riley? So Riley did. And a couple weeks later, Riley comes running out to his dad, um, who's working in the yard, and says, Dad, I found out what my gift was. And his father said, well, what is it, Riley? And Riley said, love. His parents had relayed this to me, and I was struck by it. So the next time I saw Riley, which was on Monday, I said, Riley, you know, I, I heard that you found out what your gift was. He looked at me and said, you mean love? And I said, yes, love. I said, you're blessed that you learned this so long, so young in your life. Um, this great, but deep, and simple mystery that love is the greatest gift. He looked at me a little bewildered and said, I didn't learn it, sister. I said, you didn't? You know, baffled myself. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, Jesus told me. You know, I heard him, not with my ears, but deep in my heart. I realized that I had, in a sense, stumbled upon something intimate and sacred. So I pulled back and just said, oh, that's great. And I realized that I began to cry in an area that was not my place to go. There must have been something irresistible about the Lord that the children would go to him. Can you imagine those mothers bringing their young for a blessing? The tenderness of his touch, his words to them. This is what we want the child to experience when we bring them to the Lord in prayer. The prayer of children is so powerful. He cannot refuse them or anyone who comes to him as a child. It is the relationship a child has with Christ, more than any content, that will keep him faithful in the church. In working with children, I often see that they become absorbed in their work. They will just, we'll call them and they want to continue to work. And, and often what we want to do is we want to discipline them. We want to say, come on, I told you to come. But what we need to understand is when a child is working, often what is happening to them is they're coming into contact with some truth, whether it's a religious truth, as we like to say, or whether it's a truth just of the world. All truth is one, and thus all truth is Christ. And so these, this action of child being absorbed in work is actually a preparation for the child to contemplate, or to come into contemplation with our Lord. Maria Montessori shares a story in which um, she observed this child who was taking these little cylinders and she was putting them into the appropriate size hole. And she continued to do this, as she says, 42 times she counted. This child just kept doing this over and over and over again, in apparently repetitive action. And Maria wanted to see if she could distract the child. And so she called the children together and asked them to begin to sing a song or to walk around the child or even march. 
the child continued to be absorbed, continued the action, the motion of putting the cylinders in and taking the cylinders out. And so then she decided to see what would happen if she picked up the child. So she went over, the child was sitting in a chair, and she picked the child up, and she moved the child. The child quickly gathered the cylinders into her lap, and when she was put back down, continued the process again. And Maria let her continue this until finally, after a period of time, for no apparent reason, the child stopped, looked up, smiled, eyes glistening. She wouldn't put the work away, and then she came to join the other children as if refreshed from a long sleep. She observed this often with many children, and I've seen signs of it myself with the, old, with the children I teach, that they just, they, they will enter into a work and then put the work away and come back refreshed as if their soul had expanded as they contacted truth. How do we teach children to pray? By creating an atmosphere of prayer in the classroom, by praying with children, by formally teaching the five main types of prayer, by teaching memorized prayer, by teaching traditional forms of prayer, and by preparing the children for the liturgy. My mother would always often tell us that our Lord is a gentleman. And I have thought about that. Our Lord doesn't interrupt us. He waits for us. That's so key in the life of prayer. He's not going to come barging in. He's going to wait for us to be silent. And I tell the children this, that it's important that we create this atmosphere of silence within ourselves for the Lord to fill it with his presence. So silence isn't an absence, it's actually a fullness, a fullness waiting for our Lord to come in and enter into conversation with us. Catherine of Siena um, found this inner self, what she would call it. She was isolated by her family because they didn't like where she was going in her life and they didn't want her to become a Dominican. So they sent her to her room and she stayed there for a long time, months. And in that quiet space in her room, she found this inner self, this quiet place within herself. And then when our Lord came to her and told her to go out and to bring the gospel and to go help the sick, she actually hesitated. She didn't want to leave because she didn't want to leave that spirit of quiet, of solitude that she found in the silence. But our Lord told her that he was with her he was in her. So she took this inner cell within her out to others. And that is the, the Dominican um, motto, to contemplate, to get to others, our fruits of our contemplation. So it's only in silence that we can nurture this fruit, this contemplation, so that we can bring it to others. Maria Montessori also found the value in this silence. She thought it was so important, so essential to the child in all areas that she created a lesson called the Lesson of Silence. And in this lesson, what she does is simply the children will sit and she'll quiet them down, or just not quiet them, she'll direct them in getting themselves quiet, starting with their feet, their hands, their head. And then she actually has them drink in the noises around them, which I think is important has them become more attentive to the birds outside, the cars driving by, whatever it might be, the small steps outside the room. But as you drink in those sounds, you yourself are quieted within you, and those sounds can become a part of your prayer. And as the children sat there quietly, then she would call their name one by one in a whisper, and the child would get up, walk across the room quietly to her or wherever she had directed them to go. Children love this game. They love to have the control of their bodies. 
They love to close doors quietly. They love to pick up chairs. They love that control of themselves that they have in doing these exercises. She would have exercises such as polishing leaves, as um, pouring, and all of these have control of body movement. And all that is, is a step towards prayer. Because inner, out of control becomes inner control, which then opens you up to listen, to be attentive to what the Lord has to say. Another way to teach children, to prepare children for prayer, is by teaching them the various postures of prayer and what they mean and what they're for. Standing is one of the postures of prayer. When we stand, it's a sign of reverence. We teach children when somebody comes in the room, like a priest or principal or somebody, a mayor or the governor, that we, we stand for them as a sign of reverence. So standing is a, an appropriate posture for prayer. Standing also is a preparation for movement or going forward. So when we stand, it's like we're getting ready to go out. One of the traditional positions of prayer in the church is the orate position, which is standing with your hands up. And that was a way of showing praise to God with the hands extended. You see the priests do this often during the Mass. Another posture of prayer is sitting. When we sit, it's a posture of receptivity. During the Mass, we sit during the Liturgy of the Word because we are being receptive of God's Word. Sitting is often uh, the position of meditation or contemplation because we are trying to be receptive to God and what He has to say to us so that we can respond to Him. Another posture of prayer is kneeling, and genuflecting is similar to kneeling. When we kneel, we are showing that God is so great, that He is God, and that we are His creatures that He has made. So it is a posture of humility when we kneel. Another posture of prayer is prostrating ourselves before God, completely lying down. And the prostration is a sign of, a sign of total surrender to the Lord and total adoration, giving our entire self to Him. Finally, it's also important to teach children how to fold their hands in prayer and the meaning of folding their hands. When we fold our hands, we're recollecting all our thoughts so that we can focus on the Lord in our prayer. Our hands, when they're folded like this, sort of point up to God like an arrow, and it helps sort of know we want our thoughts and our prayers right now to go right up to Him. When we fold our hands this way, it reminds us that we're united with God. Prayer is speaking and listening to God, and we are united with Him. Often when it's time to pray with the children, we will quiet down, make it silent, have a few moments of silence. Then as a way to lead them deeper into prayer, to teach them a way to pray. It's, it's effective to start off with the simplest prayer, just the name of Jesus. And slowly, we together will repeat the name of Jesus. Jesus. We can go from that or you can put in, um, I love you, um, you are great, come to my heart. There's, so, there's many just simple phrases that are like mantras, which can lead children and ourselves into a state of prayer where our Lord can speak to us. Around the classroom and even at home, we often have statues or images of the saints of Jesus and the Blessed Mother. And these are important aids in, in prayer. Because we teach the children about these people or Christ and whatever they may be depicting. But other times I will see the children without me being there with them. I'll see them go up and just touch the hand of Mary or the statue of Jesus I have outside the classroom. Or I'll walk by and I'll see little notes in their hands or flowers. These little acts and gestures are a prayer. A prayer of the child that I just happen 
to see them doing, but they delight the Lord and Our Lady. I'd like to have a little prayer corner in the classroom where the children can go as they wish, and I like to switch it out depending on the liturgical season. This past Easter, I had a beautiful statue of um, our Lord, the Rio de Janeiro um, statue of Jesus with his arms outstretched. And I put that on the table next to an empty tomb for the resurrection. And then put a little candle there and a plant and just left it there. The children noticed those things. And one day I came to the classroom after school and went over and was just looking at the table because there was a paper that was left out. It's just kind of cleaning up. But I picked it up and read it and it said, To Jesus from Ian. And then I opened up the card and it was a little message that he had written and just stuck under the statue of Jesus. And Ian wrote something like, Dear Jesus, I love you very, 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 very much. I can't wait to be with you in heaven. Love, Ian. And I, if that statue wasn't there, that little display to remind him and sort of stir up his love for our Lord, I don't think he would have done that. So those little reminders that we have around the classroom expose the children to the beauty of art or um, remind them of a person, of our Lord, of the different saints that are always there for us and spur the child's devotion. Often when driving around in New Mexico, we would go over the mountains and my mother would exclaim, look at that panoramic view. Or when we would be um, just driving in the city, at sunset time, she'd stop the car and say, oh, let's look at that sunset. Or she would, a storm coming, we'd always go outside and watch the storm coming over the mountains. She delighted in the, in the beauty that God had created for her. And she would always bring it back to, look what the Lord has done. And inside of me, that developed this, this attitude of the awesomeness, of the wonder of God, that He had given this to me. So I need to take time to appreciate it, to enjoy it, to let it become a part of me. And this is important for children, too. Children are naturally drawn to nature, and they will actually bring up things that I myself may miss, especially small things. You know, every rock is unique, and every flower is just the best. And they want to take it home, they want to give it to you. So they already are naturally drawn to nature. But it's important for us to make that next step with them that the Lord has given us this beautiful rock. Let's enjoy it. Let's look at it together. The Lord has given us this flower. Let's put it in a special place. Let's raise it up and give it back to the Lord. The art of wonder leads to um, questioning. You know, we need to question or arouse questions within the children. Simply like, I wonder how Mary felt when she received the message from the angel. I wonder what power is inside that seed that makes it grow. These questions arouse within us this awareness, this awesomeness of God. This awesomeness of God, that this fear of the Lord that we learn about with the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The fear of the Lord is to realize that He is all-powerful. He is all great. In the great sunset, or even in the smallest seed, God is present there, revealing Himself to us in nature, in the scriptures, and in truth. One of the primary ways we teach children to pray is using the scripture. The scripture is, is essential for teaching children how to pray because it puts them in direct contact with the Word of God. The Scripture is the Word of God. When we put the Scriptures before the child, as they come directly from the Bible, it will put them directly with God. They can come to know God directly through His Word, through the Scriptures. I often will ask questions and lift the text with them to help them contemplate or enter into it in a deeper way. And recently I was teaching the children talk as a parable of the Good Shepherd. And as a follow-up the next day, I was going to read with them 
Psalm 23. And I take a portion of it, and then I would ask them questions such as, what did the Lord say to you in this passage? Or, what did you find interesting? And so I pulled up the scripture, I opened the Bible, and I began to read to the children. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. In meadows of green grass, he makes me lie down. By quiet waters, he leads me, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path. And I asked the children, so what did you hear in that passage? One child said, quiet waters. I said, yeah, quiet waters. I wonder why he brings them by quiet waters. Another child said, so that they can get a drink. It would be hard to get a drink from loud waters. Or another child said, yes, rough waters would probably make them drown. I said, yes, he leads us by quiet waters. And another child said, he makes us lie down. Why would he make us lie down? And another child said, well, maybe they needed to rest. And yes, he knows what his sheep need, doesn't he? They probably needed to rest. And then began to talk about the right path, as opposed to the wrong path. The right path, they said, was smooth and filled with light, because Jesus is light. But the rough path, or the wrong path, was rough, had spiders and all kinds of scary things in it. So he would direct them away from the wrong path and lead them to the right path. We went on with our questioning and thinking about it. We closed with, um, we sighed the psalm. I pulled out the prayer card and held it up for the children. And we read it together, and then we sang a song about the Good Shepherd. Um, at the end of it, one child said, Sister, the translation that you, or the words that you use in the Bible are different from the ones on the card. And I looked at the card, and sure enough, the card said, He lets us lie down. She said, That one says lets, and you read makes. I said, You're right. I said, which do you prefer? And unanimously, they all said, let's. And I said, why? And she said, because he gives us a choice. I said, yes. The Good Shepherd, our Lord, gives us a choice. For love has to choose. And our Lord knows that about his sheep and about us. When I teach scripture to the children, I'm often baffled because what I would have accentuated in that was not what they accentuated. It is evident to me that the Holy Spirit is guiding them and me through the scriptures as we read it and as we contemplate it together. Sacred art appeals to the children, and I love taking sacred art and using it as a way of Lexio Divina to bring the children into contact with Christ and into contact with prayer. And so I'll often start at the beginning of the year with, with this image of St. Dominic. And without hesitation, the children notice that Dominic is reading a Bible. They, they can see that. And then we start looking at his posture, his hands. His hands is up to his face, and the other one is actually touching the scriptures. He himself is touching, communicating, reaching out to touch the scriptures and how important that is you know, in our incarnation that the word became flesh and we want to touch it. And so we carry on with that as we look at St. Dominic and we ourselves try to we ourselves try to take the example and do it. Um, how we handle the scripture. I teach them to pick the Bible up and to kiss it, to reverence it and to treat it with devotion and so from then on, the children will always pick up the Bible and kiss it, or I'll see them go by the Bible and kiss it. So teaching them how to handle and how to appreciate the Word of God, as Dominic is doing here in this picture. After showing the children the detail of St. Dominic contemplating the Word of God, I then show them the whole picture that Fra Angelico has painted here. 
and I guide the children through it as we look at what's happening to Christ. It's apparent that this is the mocking of Christ. They're slapping him, spitting on him, hitting him. And Christ is blindfolded. And then I say, or they may even point out that Christ is holding something. What is he holding? He's holding a scepter in one hand and the orb, the world in the other. These are signs of authority. That even though while he is being mocked, he is still the ruler and king of the universe. And then we see our lady over here turning away from the scene. For it is, it is very difficult for her. And the children will notice that she can't look at it. For her motherly heart is, is offended and hurt for what is happening to her son. And then I bring them back to Dominic. Why is Dominic here? I ask them, was he there when Christ was mocked and scourged? And they say, no, he wasn't. And then I would go back to, remember when we looked at what Dominic was doing? And they remember, he's reading the Bible. He's reading the Bible. So they, I say, I wonder what he's reading about. And without a moment of hesitation, they say, he is reading about when Jesus was mocked, when Jesus was spit upon. And I say, yes, Dominic is there. And when we read scriptures, we are there with our Lord. We enter into this relationship with our Lord. We enter into what He is going through. That's why scriptures are so important, that we read them, that we handle them with care, and that we listen to what is being read to us, or what we read in the scriptures. Lexio Divina is another way of praying with children. Lexio Divina is the art of sacred reading. Usually it applies to the scriptures, but it can also be used with other texts as well. Pope Benedict often spoke or wrote of um, the need for a renewal in the practice of Lexio Divina. So it is a lovely form of prayer to introduce to children. Lexio Divina begins with a slow reading of the scriptures, like more like poetry than like reading a book. And then it moves into meditation, where you slowly go through the passage and see how it speaks to your heart. And then in its highest form, Lexio will lead to contemplation, which is more like simply being with the Lord. A good visual for the child is like you and the Lord walking along the beach, where you think about a good friend that you have and how you can be together and you don't necessarily have to say anything. You just being in each other's presence, you've grown to know each other that you can almost um, just know what the other is thinking. And that um, ultimately is where we want the child to get in their relationship with the Lord. Anyone remember the gospel from Mass today? Oh. Yes, yes, yes. No. I'd like for us to reflect on that. You got oh. It was um, John. It was from the Gospel of John. Does anyone know which story it was? No. Jesus was with Peter. Sarah? He was giving him a second chance because Peter denied him. Cecilia? Yeah, like Sarah, he was giving Peter a second chance and they were on the, they were walking on the lake with the mud and the rocks and the pebbles that you see. And um, he was asking, do you love me? And since he was giving him a different chance, he was really good. Genesis? <laughs> uh, kind of like what Cecilia said. He was asking, do you love me? Hello, Peter. And someone else, I think they said, God, you know everything. You know I love you. But he, he was saying that um, even though he knows, he has to hear it from you. Just it doesn't matter what you know, it matters what they say to him. Okay, this um, story of Jesus and Peter is found at the very end of the book of John, right before Acts of the Apostles start. So it's John 21. Okay, I thought the end was John 20. 
John 21, verse 15. So if you please turn to that now, Big Sarah. You can help a neighbor if you get there. Good. I'm going to read our scripture for today, and then we'll take a minute or two of silence. As I'm reading it, just like we've done this week, try to find one or two verses that kind of stick out at you and repeat them in your minds and hearts, and see what the Lord might be teaching you in this gospel today. And then I'll ask you some questions, and we'll talk about um, this verse. Start with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Let's ask especially the Holy Spirit to come and shed his light in our minds and hearts as we read the Holy Scriptures. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He then said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that he had said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, Follow me. Is there a particular verse from this gospel? The Holy Spirit spoke to you? Morgan? Um, 18 and 19. Would you like to tell a little bit about that? Uh, like how, like, like when he was younger he would dress himself? Yeah. And what, what do you think the Lord meant when he said you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you? And this was signifying the kind of death he would glorify God. How did Peter die? Do you, do you know that?
feed his lambs and feed his sheep. Peter had been a, a fisherman, and then he was an apostle. Why would Jesus tell him to do that? Genesis? He doesn't need the sheep, he needs us. We are the sheep. <coughs> we are the sheep of God, and God is our holy shepherd. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Peter has saint in front of his name now. Saint? How did he become a saint? He's a saint. Peter is a saint. I know. How could Peter become a saint? When he had denied Jesus three times. Morgan? Uh, one, he was an apostle and followed Jesus for a very long time. And Second, he, he, he became the first pope and first, he died for Jesus. Definitely. Ben, were you going to say anything different? Or, I was going to say he was a martyr. End our class just looking at those last two words, follow me. And let's ask the Lord. Um, it, I'm just going to lead you in a little prayer. Ask the Lord where He would like to lead you, what His calling is for you in, my, in our little ending prayer for today. Um, dear Lord, we thank you for our time together and praying these scriptures. Please help us to know your will and give us the grace, like St. Peter, to follow you. When we deny you in our sins and our weaknesses, please show us the same mercy and love that you showed St. Peter. And give us the grace to follow your holy will throughout our whole lives. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our gentleman can help take the Bibles back to the second grade room. Can I help you? The gentleman. Can I help you? We'll get you another day. I need to Just All right. Thank you, third grade. The catechism names five types of prayer. We can introduce these formally to the children. The first type of prayer is blessing or adoration. The second type is petition. The third type is intercession. The fourth type is thanksgiving. And the fifth type is praise. In blessing or adoration, we acknowledge that God is God and that we are his humble children. When we present uh, this prayer to children, we want to teach them the titles for God, and the, type, the different attributes of God. For example, since God is the Father, we want to use the term Creator as well, Lord. Then we want to move into the names for Jesus, that He is our Savior, He is Emmanuel, Wonderful, Counselor, Prince of Peace, all of the different names, Christ, Anointed One, that helps us to name God helps the children to know um, who God is. And then for the Holy Spirit, that he's our comforter, the spirit of truth, a protector, and then different attributes of God, that he is all-powerful, that he's omniscient everywhere, that he's all-knowing, that he's all-holy. Those help us to know and help the children to know that God is God and that we are his children, and they aid us in the prayer of adoration or blessing. The second type of prayer is petition. Um, the Catechism says that the first movement of prayer, a petition, is asking forgiveness. Through forgiveness, we move towards communion with the Trinity, but also communion with each other. And after this, then we are able to receive whatever it is we are asking the Lord to give to us. When I was teaching at an inner city school, this became very apparent to me as um, when I first entered the school, most of these children were uncatechized. They didn't know who Christ was, they didn't know anything about the faith. 
And so as the year moved on, I would see little lights shining in them and coming out of them. And one is a little boy, Michael. Around Thanksgiving, Michael was sobbing over in the corner, and Stephen came up to me and said, Sister, Michael won't stop crying. And so I went up to Michael and said, Michael, what's wrong? And he said, last year in kindergarten, I was throwing carrots in the cafeteria, and I let Steve take the blame. And I said, okay, well, let's go to Steve, and you can apologize and move on. So we went to Stephen and he apologized for what he had done last year. And about 10 minutes later, Michael again was sobbing. And I went up to Michael and I said, Michael, you know, you asked forgiveness from Stephen and he's forgiving you. You know, you can move on. You don't need to keep reliving that moment. And he said, well, also in Mrs. Waters class in kindergarten, I stole her Play-Doh. And I said, oh. Okay, so we went to go visit the kindergarten teacher and Michael apologized for having stolen the Play-Doh. And it became apparent to me that Michael was actually going through a conversion. He was taking that first step to conversion towards moving to communion with Christ. And within a year, Michael and his family came into the church. The third type of prayer is intercession or intercessory prayer. St. John Vianney would say that our Lord loves to be bothered. This type of prayer is natural for children. They love to pray for others. They love to think of others, and they're very observant about the other people's needs. So often in class, it's good to take time and allow the children to name people that they know need prayers or their own particular intentions. Sometimes in class I've had a journal where they could write their intentions or have a board where they could note intentions and we'd keep, up, um, the, keep writing on the board different prayer intentions throughout the year and refer to them. We call that our prayer board. The fourth type of prayer is thanksgiving or gratitude. In teaching, I have found that the children that are the most grateful are actually those that have the least the least of things, or the least affection. And it surprised me, because I thought that things, thanksgiving or gratitude was something that was taught at home, and it can be. But from the heart, these children that I taught that were inner city kids would thank me for the smallest thing. Um, I remember one time we had done these constellations, and I matted their pictures on colored paper. And one of the little girls came up and said, Sister, thank you for putting my picture on a piece of colored paper. So you're welcome. And another one would thank me for hanging their work up on the wall. She said, it makes me so proud when you hang my pictures up on the wall. And I became aware that these children were showing signs of gratitude that children I taught other places who kind of took it for granted that I was doing these gestures for them. And so it is this attitude of thanksgiving or gratitude that opens us up to receive the blessings from our Lord. And it is this attitude that we must teach the children to enter into the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving, or our Lord's presence in the Blessed Sacrament, whereby being grateful for this seemingly small gift of our Lord in the form of bread and wine opens us up to receive the greatest gift Himself within the Eucharist. Psalm 148 is a beautiful example of the prayer of praise. It praises God for His specific wonders in creation. Most of the psalms are beautiful prayers of praise. One year I decided to take that Psalm 148 and take the different lines apart and give each child one line to illustrate, because it said, praise him shining stars, praise him sun and moon, praise him all his creatures. So it sort of leads itself for the children to illustrate it as well. But one, children, one child did the stars had the line about praising God for the shining stars. And I didn't edit their spelling because um, it was religion class. And I just um, had their works and their beautiful works of art and their passage of scripture on them as well. And I put them out in the hallway and one of the teachers came by and said, um, did you notice that, that one paper out there? It said, 
praise him sinning stars. The child had misspelled shining, <laughs> but it was, it was precious. Actually, all of the Psalms um, show all of the five types of prayer in them. You see um, King David rending his heart when he had done something wrong, asking God for mercy. You see him praising God for his goodness. You see him praising him just because he is God. You see him praying for others that are beseeching God. So all of those types of prayer are in the Psalms um, as well. Another great way of teaching all of the types of prayer is introducing the children into the collect. The collect begins with, it, with addressing God, usually under the title as Father. Then it moves into an attribute of God, what something he has done, something that describes God. The middle section of the collect is where we um, express our petition, asking God for something, and then usually why we're asking him. They'll say because, maybe he's all good, or he, he can do this. And then it goes to the ending where we ask Christ as the intercessor to, to intercede on our behalf. And there is also usually a Trinitarian ending. Usually each person of the Trinity is mentioned in the Collect at the end. The Collect is an ancient form of prayer in the church and a beautiful way to introduce the types of prayer to the children. When I taught third grade, I gave the explanation of the collect and we looked at several different examples of collects and they could identify these different elements in the collect. And then I asked them to um, try to lead our class prayers. And we didn't exactly follow the form of the collect. We did a simple, simple version. I would ask the children to um, praise God in their own words or offer some thanksgiving in their own words, some adoration to start with that prayer and then move into some um, either personal petitions, petitioning God or intercessory prayer for others, and then ending with some sort of prayer that we could all pray together. And at first I had to, to exemplify that for them and model it for them, but then eventually they were able to lead class and they love leading the class prayer. Our prayer, Mary, would you like to Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for help for this wonderful religion class. I pray for my the repose of the soul of my grandfather. And I pray for all the people who died. I pray for I pray for anybody who needs help right now. Angel of God, my heart is dear. The church, as the body of Christ, has also given us some traditional forms of prayer that we want to learn and take to heart. And these are the prayers that we want the children to memorize, mostly by practicing them over and over. Memorized prayer is helpful, one, because it helps us to pray together. Our Lord said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, uh, there am I in their midst. So when we can all pray together in the same words, our Lord is there. Another reason that we want the children to memorize this prayer is because it is, these prayers are part of the rich heritage of the church that have been passed down to us. Also, sometimes we don't know exactly what words to say. So if we go to the Psalms or if we go to the Memorare or the Hail Mary or the Our Father, or if we want to just praise God and the glory be, we have the words and we know those words are true. We can trust them because they've come to us from the church. The whole goal of memorized prayer, though, is that the child 
makes it a habit coming from their heart. Sometimes the, the danger in memorized prayer is that it becomes just rote words and there's a disconnect. But if we encourage the children to pray from their hearts, that their words and their thinking and their heart are all one, then that is, that is the ultimate goal. That is what gives true pleasure to the Lord. We also want to do this when we teach them how to genuflect or make the sign of the cross, or when they go into church to get holy water, that they really, truly take the time and think, oh, this is a reminder of my baptism. I'm making the sign of the cross. I'm a child of God. He died for me on the cross. That comes from their hearts and aren't just words from their lips. Traditions um, build a culture, and the root word of culture is religion. So it's important that we pass on these traditions to our children. Traditions root us in identity larger than ourself, but they also include us, and that's important for the children. It's like a tree. The tree, the roots go down, and the branches grow up. And so we must not forget our roots, where we have come from. And so it's important that as educators that we present to the children. First we have to internalize, what does this tradition mean to me? I know in my family we had traditions um, around during Advent we would put a straw into the manger for every sacrifice we did. And so these traditions rooted us in what was happening within the life of the church. And so it's important that you internalize it yourself and also know where the tradition came from. Where was this beginning? And how does that apply to me? Children, as we all do, want to belong. So it's important to know what we belong to and how we belong to it so that we can enter into it with the children. With traditions that we have in the church, it's good to take on the life of the liturgy of the church, the of the liturgical calendar. So perhaps doing the rosary during the month of October or the month of May, which are dedicated to Our Lady of the Rosary, and expounding on that with the children. Another thing would be to take on First Fridays, adoration, adoration on First Fridays with the children will bring out that tradition of how that started and actually even uh, Margaret, Margaret Mary with the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Um, during Lent, to go with the children on the Stations of the Cross, to walk through the Stations of the Cross with the children. And even during those times of celebration, perhaps having a little celebration at Christmas, you know, not during Advent, but at Christmas, having a celebration with the children, having a celebration, an Easter celebration with the children, taking time out of your day to celebrate, to give your time to that in the school when you're with the children, speaks to them of the importance of the traditions that we have in the church. Speaking of traditional prayer and memorized prayer. I remember when I was a child, we would often pray the rosary on the way to Mass or on trips when we had time. And I remember one particular day I announced to my parents quite proudly that I could be praying the rosary with them in the car and be looking out the window and looking, watching people, looking at the billboards or different buildings at the same time as I was praying. Like I was a little I could multitask, pray, and do that at the same time. And to which my parents responded that that was certainly not the point of our prayer together, praying the rosary in the car. And then they explained to me the importance that when we pray the rosary, we're not, we're not just thinking about the prayers or thinking about something else. We're supposed to be meditating on the, the mysteries that they represent. So that was a little lesson for me. I also remember a student when we were on our way to adoration, and she asked me, Sister, about how long is our adoration time? And I said, well, our, our time slot is about 20 minutes, Samantha. And then Samantha says, okay, I think that's enough time to say all my prayers. She wanted to make sure she had enough time for her prayers, she was going to say.
liturgy to the children. I am aware of the, the, the church's law of prayer, which is lex orandi, lex credendi, which is the law of prayer is the law of belief, that as the church prays, the church believes. So it is important that when we're teaching the children that we take the words from the liturgy, which the mass, or even from the words of the sacrament that are said by the priest. But to start this, we first teach the gestures, because the gestures themselves speak. You know, I'll talk to the children about what is a gesture, what does this gesture mean? What does this gesture mean? So they're very aware of, of gestures that we do daily. And so they, they actually enter into this life of gestures. And so when you're teaching children, um, such as the epiclesis, the first gesture you would show would just be a gesture of hands coming down. And then you'd ask the children, what did I do? And they would say, well, you started up and your hands came down. And then you would go on and discuss, well, what does that mean? And they'll say, well, God's coming down. And I'll say, yes. And just kind of move on. And you may, depending on the age of the child, move on to the words. But at times, it's sufficient just to do the gesture. Maybe the handshake of peace, or it may be the anointing with the oil, or it may be the laying on of hands. There are so many gestures, the sign of the cross, that we use in the liturgy and in the sacraments that it's important just to start there and then following that maybe the next year or the next week saying well let's go back and let's look at that gesture and let's listen to what the church says let's listen to the words that are prayed during this gesture and then that again lifts it up to a higher element and actually sometimes it makes sense he say that as the priest's hands are coming down lord send down your spirit upon these gifts and the kids, oh, it's the Holy Spirit who's coming. And they make that connection without you having to instruct them. They themselves have come into contact with the gesture and the words and have made the liturgy make sense to them. And therefore, when they go to Mass, they watch so carefully everything the priest is doing. And they'll even lean over to me and say, Sister, look what he's doing. They are very aware of what is happening at the Mass after they have been presented with the gestures and the words of the liturgy. My parents always wanted to teach us what was going on in the Mass. I remember when my youngest brother, Mike, was probably three or four, my parents were teaching him about the most important part of the Mass, the consecration. And my mother explained that when you heard the bells ring and you saw Father hold up the host or the chalice, it was truly becoming Jesus' body and blood, soul, and divinity. So, uh, and she used the word miracle. She said a miracle is happening because it looks like bread, it tastes like bread, feels like it, looks the same, but a miracle happens. Something totally new is there. It's Jesus now. So one day we were going to Mass, and Mike was kneeling there trying to be good, as best as a three or four or five year old could be good at church. And it came time for the consecration and the bells rang and Father was holding up the host now of Jesus. Well, Mike stood up on the kneeler and turned around and said, hey everyone, it's a miracle, it's a miracle. To which Father kind of looked over and my mom was mortified. But at the same time, it was a beautiful witness of the truth of what was happening at that moment in the mass. Knowledge leads to love. When a child knows and understands what's going on in the liturgy, it helps them to participate. It helps them internally to know how to pray during the Mass or whatever liturgy, the other sacraments as well. It also helps them externally to know what the gestures are for, what their postures we stand when we kneel. So it helps them to externally participate. We also want the children to know the responses for the different sacraments, especially the Mass, and to teach them those responses and what their part is and what those responses mean. During this segment, 
we'd like to share with you some tools that have helped us promote reverence at the parochial school weekly mass. At our school, uh, where we do sacramental pre preparation with the children, the entire school attends mass from pre-K to eighth grade. And we use five to seven minutes of brief catechesis for the whole school, the recitation of a decade of the rosary together with the school in a kind of meditated fashion, which we'll share with you and, and illustrate. We've paid a special attention to some details in the chapel where mass is held or in the church. Um, perhaps the, your school has its mass in the, in the uh, parish church, such as flowers, and the training of altar boys. And we've particularly chosen certain songs which seem to help the children uh, absorb the beauty of the doctrine of the real presence of Jesus at Mass, and we'd like to share some of that, those details of music with you as well. In that five or seven minute catechesis before Mass, we'll touch on a point of doctrine or witness of uh, Christian life, such as one week we might talk about the Eucharistic fast, the hour of not eating or drinking, including gum, except for water, or in the case of somebody who's sick, of course, they're exempt from the fast. We explain the Eucharistic fast to the entire school. And we notice that uh, many times we have parents of the teachers there for the school mass if their children are reading. And we see the adults learn from that brief catechesis as well as the children. We might, uh, during those brief minutes of catechesis, we might be talking about the liturgical season we're in and how certain seasons, such as Christmas and Easter, have an octave, eight days of celebrating that great feast. And uh, this is news to the children and the adults that are there. We might talk about a particular saint, which in, uh, illustrates beautifully in their life uh, love of the Eucharist or heroic love of the Lord. So we use that time to put across a point, and the children are very interested in it, and we get the feedback later on what they've absorbed of that brief catechesis. When we first began teaching once a week at a small Catholic school, and we were present for the weekly school mass, we saw at first that the children, particularly the younger children, were kind of restless, and even the older children maybe were not very recollected. And so we were wondering how we could instill more reverence in the children. And one of the things we began to do right away was before Mass began, we would pray together one decade of the rosary. And before we would pray, we would, one of the sisters would take a mystery of the rosary and lead a short meditation on it. So why the rosary? Well, because Mary, she has a particular role, which is really to bring us to Jesus. And she is such a mother. And so, as one priest explained it, Our Lady is like a pair of glasses. When I take my glasses off, I can't see. But when I put my glasses on, I can see. But the things I'm looking at are no different than they were with or without my glasses. So Mary, as she said herself, she magnifies the Lord. And when she magnifies God, though, she's not making him any bigger or better, but she shows him to us in a way that we can understand. And we really see that in the mysteries of the rosary, which are really the mysteries of the life of Christ. And so when we meditate on the mysteries of the rosary, we're really learning the gospel, but we're learning it with Mary. It's kind of like going with Mary and looking at her picture album of the life of Jesus. So what we'll do maybe is we'll mention the mystery of the rosary before mass, and then we'll use, I'll, I or one of the other sisters will lead a meditation where we use our imagination to enter into the mystery. So for instance, at the birth of Christ, we'll imagine that we are in Bethlehem and we see the shepherds and we wonder where they're going, so we follow them and 
we find ourselves going into a little stable and we find this beautiful lady with a baby and she puts him in our arms and we look into his eyes and we see the eyes of God. Or with the presentation, we, I might use that as an example that Simeon, he was the only one who recognized Jesus as the Son of God. Everyone else just saw him as a little baby. So here we are in the chapel and we look at our Eucharistic Lord and the rest of the world might only see a piece of bread, but we pray that we will be able to recognize Jesus who is truly the Son of God. And so we found that as soon as we began doing this, when we started doing a decade of the rosary with the meditation, there was this immediate transformation in the chapel. It suddenly there was an atmosphere of prayer and it was, it was immediate. And it was one of the easiest things we've done, I think, that really made a large impact on the entire school. And the children learn the rosary that way. And then that really illustrates how to pray and to meditate. And then that carries over into the rest of their prayer life. They might begin praying the rosary as a family at home. And so I found that most helpful. I've really noticed that both in class and in our catechesis before mass, the children really responded to the witness of the saints. Paul VI stated once that this generation listens to witnesses more than teachers. And if it listens to teachers, it's because they are first witnesses. One day I spoke about a young Italian, she's a venerable now, venerable Antonietta Mayo, who's known as Nenalina. She died at the age of six and a half, and she used to write these little letters to God. From the time she could speak, she began doing this. She died of bone cancer, but she had this beautiful relationship with God, and she understood the power of suffering. And I read to the children some of the letters that she wrote. Um, she spoke about, she said, my God, I hope you will make me better, but if not, that's okay, your will be done. I know that because I suffer, that means I'm one of your favorites. And as she was about to, she was preparing to receive her first Holy Communion, she wrote to the Lord, she said, Jesus, I'm going to receive you and I'm so happy. I have a beautiful white dress, but I know that the most beautiful thing, the most important thing is to have a beautiful dress for my soul. And I went on like this, reading little excerpts from her letters and this child, she was only six and a half. She had this incredible, it was really the gift of understanding. She had this deep wisdom that comes, can only come from God. But I remember at the end of the school year, and this was several weeks afterwards, I asked a group of the sixth graders, I said, what is the one thing that you most remember that the sisters talked about before mass? And they all immediately said, oh, when you told us about Ninalina. And I discovered both in class and in our catechesis before Mass, that the importance of the witness of the saints, I think, has taught as much or more than anything else that we've told the children. If we want to instill reverence at Mass, we have to cultivate it in ourselves. You can tell them to be reverent, but during Mass, they're watching me. And this doesn't mean putting on an act and trying to look holy, but I have to cultivate the reverence and the piety if I intend to be able to inspire that in the children. Another thing that we have found very helpful in instilling reverence is, well, we've seen the importance of music. We actually put together a small supplement of songs that we thought would help inspire devotion in the children. And you could do the same. Several classic hymns to Our Lady and to Our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament that Really, they have beautiful theology, and they teach so much, and the children remember them. One thing that we taught also was we taught them the simple Latin mass responses. So the Kyrie, the Sanctus, the Agnus Dei, and we taught the whole school. And at one point, towards the end of our first year, I went in with another sister to visit the third grade, just because they asked if we would stop in, and we were going to sing some songs together. And I said to them, what is your favorite song that you've learned the whole year? And they all yelled, Sanctus, Sanctus. And so those who think that the Latin is 
strange or foreign to the children or that they wouldn't like it. I mean, it was, it was very obvious. The kids actually really enjoyed learning them. And we always put a translation right below so that they know what they're actually singing. It's not just these sounds that they don't understand. And when we would pray the decade of the rosary before mass, after we finished the decade, we would always add the little Ave, Ave, Ave Maria. And the children loved that, and they all caught on immediately. And on the days that it would happen that perhaps we couldn't have mass for some reason, we began to pray the rosary together. The whole school, we would pray the whole rosary. And again, each, after each decade, we would sing the little Aves. And they all sing so enthusiastically. It's, it's beautiful, actually, to see how much they enjoy it. We began also in several of the, the classes, we, we taught them several, you might call them little devotional songs, short little things, and we would use them as a prayer before or after the class. So there's one that speaks about, I will come to the fountain of mercy. I place all my trust in your mercy. Jesus, I trust in you. And I remember when I was teaching this to the second grade, I was writing on the boards the words so that they could see them, and I wrote, I will come to the fountain of mercy. And I asked, I said, can anyone here tell me what the fountain of mercy is? And one little girl said, is it the precious blood of Jesus? And I said, yes, it is. And she realized she had this connection. And one day, I remember I saw three of the kids, and they, were, they had been playing, and all of a sudden I saw them run into the chapel. So I walked in just to see what they were doing, and I saw them, they were lined up in front of the altar. They had their arms on the altar with their chins there, and they were singing this song that we had taught them, Jesus, I trust in you, and to Jesus. And afterwards, one of the little girls came to me and she said, I went right up to the tabernacle and I kissed it. And I just, it really melted my heart to see how much devotion they had and how they, these little songs, short little ones that they could learn so quickly, they remember and they use them for their prayer. Thank you. 